Welcome to Victoria Rumble Room, a show based in Victoria that likes to pack a punch. Sometimes we're a little punchy. I'm Robin Adair, and across town, my fellow pugilist is yeah. John Jurisic, the Croatian sensation. Doesn't that sound like a pugilist? And John, John, again, we have a, a great show, lots of things to talk about. I'll tell you right off the bat, what I really enjoy is my will and workout during your intro. Just love it. And I'm sure many I have I have many fans who enjoy working out with me. Boy, but do we have lots to talk about post-workout. Right off the top, man, we've received a ton of feedback about Al Smith's appearance last week. He's the Peninsula Chamber Executive Director, and he talked about the shortfall in housing that's coming to a crunch and a crisis like it hasn't for 10 years. Anyway, we heard comments agreeing with Al. And some wondering why there aren't more tax incentives to build market housing. We always appreciate hearing from our viewers, good, bad, and ugly. And most of them were quite reasonable. I thought the feedback for uh, Al Smith's comments were quite reasonable. And uh, keep them coming. Keep them coming. And John, um, we do like hearing about a lot of different topics because we try to carry a, a, a wide variety. And uh, today we thought we would dig into what's going on in the country where the provinces are starting to rear their heads around the Canadian constitution. And that's really something new. We haven't really seen a lot of that, but uh, boy, it's sure poking up all over the country. For example, in Ontario, Conservative Premier Doug Ford rammed through legislation overriding the Canadian Charter by imposing a contract on QP school workers. Prime Minister Trudeau phoned the Premier, said his plan was wrong and inappropriate. But some provinces are really starting to flex their constitutional muscle. Robin, I don't know how many times in the last five years I've said, man, I never thought that would happen or say, I never thought someone would say that. And it's happening all the time. So these provinces are going rogue. Never thought that would happen. In Saskatchewan, another conservative government has introduced the Saskatchewan First Act, which confirms autonomy over national natural resources. Come on now. This act means Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, not Canada, will have a final say on the exploration for non-renewable natural resources. This in particular means oil, gas, and potash. And you know that this is a, a trend right across the prairies right now. When you see in Alberta, they have even stronger language. I guess that's not really a surprise. A new conservative premier there is calling the shots. Danielle Smith is poised to implement the Alberta Sovereignty Act. And details are not yet fully clear, but uh, it is very clear that this legislation would be overriding an attempt by Ottawa to regulate and turn down new energy provinces in Alberta. There can be no doubt that the current NDP Liberal Alliance is just the latest in a long line of Ottawa governments that have frustrated the legitimate aspirations of hardworking Albertans. That stops now. When Ottawa announces policies and laws that attack our economy or violate the rights of our people, or when Ottawa seeks to take control of our sovereign areas of provincial jurisdiction, our UCP government will not enforce those laws and policies in this province, period. Let me be very clear, I will never, ever apologize for standing up for the people of Alberta and the province that I serve. So, we will pass the Sovereignty Act. Work has already begun on crafting it. We worked on it earlier this week at the caucus retreat. We still have further work to do, but I've asked for it to be ready by the time I take my seat in the legislature. We will then introduce it and we will pass it and we will use it to push Ottawa back into its own lane every single time that they step out of line and intrude on our constitutional rights. Alberta will no longer ask permission from Ottawa to be prosperous and free. So it's very clear, some Canadians are very concerned 
about our future energy production and the direction that we're going as a producer and exporter. Some are totally against it. Many are saying that it's being bridled back unnecessarily. There's a huge debate. And why else would we have talk now about Alberta sovereignty? But it looks like the debate is shifting as we see what's happening right now in Europe with Russia turning off the taps. It really opens people's eyes to the fact that our Western society cannot function without oil and gas. Sure, we have renewable energy. Sure, there's nuclear power, there's hydropower. But at this point, this point in history, it's not enough. We need to develop our alternative energy as fast as possible. No question about that. But we can't depend on it. And we won't be able to move away from fossil fuel, I suggest, for a very long time. And speaking of Europe, winter is obviously coming. Ukraine and Russia continue to be at war. Ukrainians have been on the offensive. At least that's, that's what we've been led to believe. The Russians are digging in where possible, and all of us are wishing for peace and a return to a more stable Europe, but we're clearly going to have to keep waiting. Now, with us to talk more about the situation in Ukraine, a regular uh, attendee and member of the Victoria Rumble Room is Chris Kilford, a former lieutenant colonel in the Canadian Army an instructor at Royal Roads, and the president of the Victoria chapter of the Canadian International Council. Cannot wait to hear from him about, about what's going on in Europe. So let's zoom him in. And now joining us once again in the Rumble Room is a former diplomat and soldier, Lieutenant Colonel Retired. Uh, so great to have you on the show. Chris Kilford, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, good to see you again. So right off the top, we've just put our Remembrance Day poppies away for another year and a big ceremony across Canada and across the Commonwealth. People have been thinking about sacrifice a lot in Canada, as they should. Now, you know, on this program, we've had some viewers saying, well, you're focusing too much on some of these world conflicts. We've done stuff on what's been happening in Iran with the, uh, the protests, and we've done quite a bit on the war in Ukraine. And people are saying, why aren't you focused more on Canada. And so uh, my first question to you is, do you think that people in this country are starting to get a little fatigued, if you like, with uh, foreign affairs and Ukraine in particular? Yeah, I, I do believe so. Um, and it's understandable. Uh, we, we do tend to move from one crisis to another. I mean, who thinks about Afghanistan very much right now? We have been focused on on Ukraine. It has been going on for about, well, eight months at least now. And and so it, it is understandable because there are so many challenges at home. Um, we, we know that the price of food, the price of, of gasoline, uh, the potential for a recession, uh, all of these impact Canadians. And so, yes, I mean, it is understandable that, that other concerns come to, to the forefront. I think, though... What we have to understand is that these conflicts may be overseas, but but they're actually at home. When the government talks about bringing in 500,000 uh, people to Canada in the coming years, and we already know we bring in 350,000, 400,000 already, uh, these people are coming from somewhere. Uh, yes, there are Ukrainian refugees and Afghan refugees, but people people are coming from somewhere. They're coming from Asia, they're coming from the Middle East, from Africa, and so on. These conflicts are very close to them. Uh, they, they feel it. They have families back home. So it's easy to say, focus on Canada, but that becomes more and more difficult every year as this country of ours begins to expand. And look, I mean, these things that uh, happen overseas, I, I look at Canada. There was a senator back in the 1920s that said we live in a fire, fireproof house here in Canada, far away from any conflict. And, you know, arguably that's true. And so isn't it incumbent upon us then to help out elsewhere because of our, our good fortune? That's how I always see it. Um, but but there is a balance that's required between you know the, the needs of, of, of the Canadians that are here and the Canadians that are coming because... Um, to be able to help out in the world, we need to be a prosperous country. So there's that too. So yeah. look, I, I understand um, how people people feel, 
But um, needless to say, in places like Ukraine, there are you know men, women, and children that are suffering terribly uh, because of this conflict, and you just can't turn away from that. Yeah. Um, Chris, always so much to discuss when you join us in the Rumble Room. Uh, in particular, separating fact from fiction, which is something we appreciate. Uh, I'd like to ask you about what it's like to conduct war in winter. It's starting mm -hmm. to get cold in the Ukraine. Snow can't be far off if not already there. We've seen a Ukrainian counteroffensive over the past several months. It appears to be slowing. Not sure if that's the case or not. And nonetheless, you predict that winter weather will uh, oblige or force soldiers on both sides to dig in, wait for warmer weather? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I was in Saskatoon last week uh, giving a talk about the war in Ukraine, and I had to walk from my hotel to the venue, and it was about minus 10. And I, I realized how fortunate we are here in Victoria and how cold cold is when when you're out there in the elements, so to speak. And so what we find in, in Ukraine is we're heading into the winter period. We know that the temperatures there can get very cold, minus 20, minus 25. And it does uh, cause you to stop and, and, and take stock of, of where you are. I think... Um, I think a military force, and look, I've been through so many winter warfare exercises myself, and I have to say it's, in one word, horrible. Uh, it, it, when you're in minus 30 weather and, and so forth, and you're trying to keep those trucks running, keep yourself fed, equipped, clean, that sort of thing, this, um, this uh, winter period makes your life 10 times more complicated. But if you're well-disciplined, well-led, well-equipped, well-fed, all of these things, then you can carry on. You you can still fight in the winter. And this is really important because what we do know from the Ukrainian side is that they are receiving large stockpiles of, of winter warfare equipment, whether it's their, uh, whether it's toques or gloves, mucklucks, parkas, all of that sort of thing. We know that that is on the way, some of it from Canada. And on the Russian side, every indication we read and there's all sorts of uh, information, disinformation out there. Uh, the troops are not well led, not well equipped, not well fed, and probably don't have the right winter warfare equipment. So they are going to suffer through this particular period. In fact, I would say Ukraine has the initiative now. We know that on the battlefield. And I think the winter warfare uh, piece of this is going to play into their hands and they will still be able to keep going. Uh, Arguably not as 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 much, um, uh, you know, the gains not happening as quickly as we might see during summer. But they are are going to put a lot of pressure on on the Russians. I'm I'm certain. It's interesting you know, how we have so many overlaps in the world, uh, and we've been talking about the protests in Iran and uh, marches and people wanting to see the well, many wanting to see the Islamic regime either replaced or certainly modernized. And and at the same time, we see Iran starting to send weapons. They're sending drones and missiles to Russia. And, and you wonder what the, th the thought process is. Uh, you hear it suggested maybe they want to upgrade their, their nuclear uh, capabilities. In your mind, what is it, what's the advantage for Iran getting snuggled up to a guy like Vladimir Putin? Well, I think you've got two autocracies speaking to one another. That's what this is all about. And you see reports about some North Korean ammunition being sent to, to Russia, the Chinese potentially helping as well. And now you've got Iran uh, looking about for customers for its, its drones. It's these kamikaze drones that they have and the missiles that they've developed. And of course, Russia's running out of everything and needs to go and find someone to help them out. They uh, are, as we understand, firing about 20,000 rounds of artillery ammunition every single day. I mean, the logistics of all of this is incredible. And so, yes, I mean, they turn to places like Iran who have few friends and uh, buy what they can. And so far, those drones have been very uh, effective and um, have caused a lot of problems for the uh, infrastructure and the electricity grid, all of that sort of thing in in. Uh, in you in Ukraine, so yes, I mean this is what it ends up being. It's it, it just simply a case of uh, two uh, autocracies talking to one another, uh, transactional. I don't think it impacts the nuclear program. Obviously, somebody's pockets get lined in Iran, and maybe they can spend some more money on building these things in the future and make them, you know, bigger and better and longer ranges and that sort of thing. But 
yeah, this is this is what it's all about. It's it's full into this. Now, of course, the Ukrainians are getting weapons from us, right? So um, we can't point fingers at Russia per se for having to shop the international arms bazaars for their own needs. It's just that um, you know they have to turn to to like minded countries, and and we know who they are. Chris, it looks like a lot of Ukrainians are already struggling with no heat, no electricity, no running water in the large urban areas, and that will continue. What do you think of this kind of bombing? Ah, this might be an obvious question. Nonetheless, does this type of warfare strategically work? Does it destroy morale and public spirit as it's intended to here? Well, it, it can. Uh there is a tendency for us to go back to the blitz and and of course many german cities were were turned into rubble during the war many japanese cities were were burned to the ground during the second world war and and yet morale never seemed to break i would probably say that and from what i have seen that ukrainians are just getting angrier at at russia uh with every with every bomb that drops and and so i don't think it will break the will of the ukrainian people at all i know it wouldn't break mine and i suspect it wouldn't break yours it just means that we would tough it out we would be very cold over the winter period but we certainly wouldn't let russia uh, bring us to our knees because of this and i think the will to fight at the front lines would increase as well because look i mean russia's being exposed for for what it is right and they're just if there's any doubt in anyone's mind they're they're quite happy to prove it to you uh, as to who they actually are and, and they're willing to put people through this um, because of their own strategic blunders and so um uh, you know, you know, like everything Russia has done in this conflict, it just backfires every single time. It's just a simple case that they don't know when to quit. They just don't know when to give it up, and uh, um, and so on they go. But I think I think there that, that uh, you know a lot will be dictated on the battlefield. How this all ends up at the end of the day will be dictated on the battlefield, and I don't see the Russians having the capacity at this point to. To make any that folds in very nicely with my next question, Chris. We've seen the Ukrainian army certainly holding its own on most of the fronts. It's actually been making some advances, particularly in the south. And uh, it, it seems to me that uh, we may be at a tipping point. I mean, the Russians, as you say, they're not they're not showing any great glory. They're losing a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you have to think some of this is going to reverberate to people back home. Do you think at this juncture, Putin is looking for some way to come up with some kind of a compromise? Do you think Putin is any, in any way, shape or form ready to say, look, uh, here, here is a palatable, acceptable compromise to get us out of this thing? Or do you think he just is intransigent and feels he still has to win this? Well, I think he was looking for some off-ramp at, at certain points, but the 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 initiative the speed of ukrainian advances and so on took that away from him um every day he woke up there would be some new advance on the ukrainian side of uh, on the ukrainian front and and so the off ramps now are are less and less than they were say even a month or two ago even if there were off ramps because it's been going so badly and um i think um i, I think that the ukrainians will will carry on and it will just create a situation where he he has all that. I really don't know what. I mean, this is the problem that all the analysts have. They just don't know how this is actually going to to end up. At what point does everybody say enough? Now, if Ukraine was able to recapture the Donbass and push into 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 Kherson and and take those uh, areas and stop at Crimea itself, would that be enough for President Zelensky to say this is fine? I've I've, I've done and let's talk. Uh, possibly, you know. We know, though, that the Ukrainian side is looking at regaining all the territory, and this again pushes us onto, uh, into unknown territory. If if uh, Ukrainian forces were to enter into Crimea proper, would that cause a mass panic amongst the civilian population? Would that cause Putin then to to react in some fashion? I mean, uh, you know, again, we're in that into that gray zone where we 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 just we just uh, don't know. But there's no apparent off ramps for Putin at this particular time that I see. Uh, Chris, uh, this is a question that, that quite fascinates me. 
and I'm, and Robbins alluded to it in his earlier questions. This is the notion of Canadians fighting in Ukraine. We've heard that ex-soldier ex soldiers from a number of Western countries have joined the Ukrainians and have formed a foreign legion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to know if there are many Canadians fighting in this region right now under that banner? So I've just heard the odd, I've seen the odd photograph, the odd bit of news about Canadians uh, being there and helping out. I would imagine some are dual citizens as well. That that would be a factor. They may actually be serving in regular Ukrainian units, and we may or may not hear about that. Uh, there is There are a number of foreigners, but I have to say, I'm, I'm, and, and I do tend to pay attention to this, I don't really see too much news from from the foreign element there. Sometimes it's a language issue. So if you are going there and you're not speaking Ukrainian, then you might find yourself in some support role way back, uh, you know, behind the lines. And I mean, it's a massive undertaking and um, probably worthy of, a, of, a, of, of, of some sort of big study at the end of the day. And I would imagine you might find some of the foreign f troops helping out in that capacity, because I can tell you when you're up in the front lines and you're on a radio or trying to listen to instructions, you better be able to speak the language that's being used. If you don't understand uh, what you're being told to do, you're going to be you'll be dead in, in a very short period of time. So um, that's why, unless I'm missing something, I haven't seen a lot of reports about foreign troops in, engaged in big parts of the combat that's going on. Um, I stand to be corrected, but but uh, I, I would suspect this is at its, at its core a Ukrainian uh, fight. Always great to hear from Chris Gelford. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your commitment to Victoria Rumble Room and all of our viewers. We're so pleased to bring these important international topics to our Canadian and island audience. Many people in this country have served in the armed forces in many different ways. And many more have family connections and background with Ukraine. Anyway, Robin, before we before we go, taking us from the world to national, quick word on local politics. Absolutely, John. Of course, we have a number of new mayors and councils that have been sworn in right across the country and uh, closer to home, right across British Columbia and Vancouver Island for four more years. Mm -hmm. That's a long haul. And in places like Lankert and Colwood, councils will be looking at slowing down growth. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> and in Victoria, they also have a new mayor in Marianne Alto. Uh, she continues to stand by the predecessor, Lisa Helps, and some of the moves that she made, some of them controversial. But certainly in her first statement, Mayor Alto is setting a different tone. As I've said throughout the last five months, and for much longer. I think sometimes the pace of those actions have challenged and perhaps at times overwhelmed some Victorians. So it will come as no surprise to you, and I think not a little relief, that I believe that there will be time for this council to take a breath, to let the good work now in place and underway operate, to allow some time for city staff and council to observe those operations and make adjustments as needed to ensure that everything is functioning in its highest and best way. Marion Alto has agreed to join us in the Rumble Room and we're grateful for that. And we're very much looking forward to hearing what she hopes and she and her council hope to accomplish over the next four years, as it will doubtless be carefully observed by other councils, certainly by us and, uh, and, and across the province. Absolutely. Uh, Victoria makes a lot of noise on the provincial scene, and I'm sure that's going to continue. But I, I do feel a confidence that Marianne Alto is going to put a very different style to the way City Hall is run. I'm predicting much less combative. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased about that. So, John, uh, on that happy note, perhaps you could again explain in your usual clear and concise way how people can follow the Rumble Room, like the Rumble Room, become subscribers. Uh, there's, there's so many ways to reach out and join our program. Clear and concise. Uh, maybe not. But anyway, I give it a good shot. And certainly a lot of viewers and a lot of um, uh, folks know where to find us and they comment, which we so much appreciate. 
Let's quickly review that. Facebook page, Twitter page, YouTube page summarizing all of our videos. There is a news and views Facebook group for you to post your comments and or your events, as well as a, a TikTok and Instagram page for everyone to participate in the Rumble Room. So for now, I remain your eternal humble servant, Grayson Sensation, Mayor of North Tulip, proud to live in this nation. And John, as always, very, very proud to be on the program with you. And I'm Robin Adair, Rumble On. <laughs>